Okay, well, I'm kicking off chapter nine, and I'm trying to do this actually in, in one take to go through the entire chapter um, in about, uh, about an hour. And so the um, I, I am abbreviating some of the content. Um, I encourage you to read carefully and and um, and try to grapple with all the information. But I, I really wanted to give you a, a, a bigger picture in regards to this because uh, I think it's got uh, a lot of interesting ideas and that, um, in fact, it actually helps you. Uh, at the end, we're gonna talk about some strategies for um, being able to hold things in memory better, which is actually one of the goals that you probably have for uh, your classes is you, you wish you could recall more that you're learning throughout the, the class. Okay, so to, um, to start off, it, it is difficult to test a person's memory. Um, so it's hard to compare childhood memories because you cannot easily verify them. Um, so if you ask people to share about their you know, experiences in childhood, it's some person, a person may give vivid details, but actually could potentially be um, inaccurate that they may have uh, be recalling things that got, you know, pulling in other sources, other things that, that they saw in movies or that um, other stories that other people have told them. And so the um, in, in researching memory, there's been an emphasis that we need to do this in controlled learning settings. And the basic memory methods are um, uh, memory curves, first of all. This is a, a rate at which we learn and it, at which we forget a list of items. So um, if I asked you to, if I, if I presented a list of 20 items and then uh, read through them one at a time, only, only said each item once, you're not gonna remember most likely all 20. You're probably gonna, the first time you hear it, you might recall seven or eight if you are if you're got a strong memory. And then the next time you hear it, nine or 10, 11 or 12 after that. So there's a rate at which you learn and um, there's also a rate at which you forget. We know that um, most of our forgetting happens really quickly. As soon as we learn something, we're, we're very um, prone to forget about it. And then once it's in our memory for a while, we're less likely to forget it. And so that's one of the things that the researchers in memory have tried to, to portray. Um, the, uh, another basic research method is the paired associate learning. This is where two words are paired together and the task is to remember the pair. And, um, and then serial learning is where you're learning a list in order. All right, and the father of modern memory research is Herman Ebbinghaus. Um, so he's sort of like the, the Freud of memory research uh, or the B.F. Skinner of it. And so what he did is he came up with a long, long list of all kinds of three letter nonsense words like hub or well, hub can be a word, heb, um, uh, ost, things like that, things that just don't make sense to us. And he tested it himself, interestingly. Um, so really, when we think about research, um, normally we think about testing other people, but he was the only subject because he was a, a poor research student and couldn't afford to pay participants, and so he just did it with himself. Nonetheless, he set this up in, in ways that have influenced the rest of the field. And he really identified that there's four key stages of a learning experience. There's a, a stage for learning, and then usually there's a delay, um, some, some time period between when you learn and when you are tested. Uh, so the third stage is the test. Um, and then a fourth stage is a relearning task. And again, this idea that if you hear it more than once, you're able to pick it up more, uh, more readily. And uh, again, despite the fact that he was the only subject in his research, many of his findings have held up. All right, so here's a, a um, graph that depicting a forgetting curve. Um, so we know that people tend to forget most of what they learn almost immediately after learning it. So you see this uh, uh, curved. So in the first day, most of uh, about half of, well, 
it, it really depends on what you're talking about. But in this example, about half of what a person forgets is forgotten in the first day. And then up to uh, about a week later, they're only remembering about 10%. This is one of those really sad graphs for teachers and professors because we look at that and realize um, students often are, uh, yeah, they're only gonna remember a fraction of what we actually talk about in class, um, which, is, which is sad for us, but, um, but we know that the next time you learn it, you're probably more apt to, to um, relearn it very quickly. And so that's part of the reason we think it's still valuable. Um, if you were to draw a memory curve, it would be the opposite direction. Um, it would be going up. And that's this idea that as you um, try to learn something, there is initially a very steep learning curve, and then it gets slower to learn more after that. <clears throat> now, one of the um, one thing to know about memory is that, um, and, and you're probably familiar with this idea, is that there's a difference between free recall and recognition. Um, so free recall is where you are asked to recall something from memory. Um, so an example of this would be try to recall the all seven of the seven dwarfs. Uh, what were their names? And if you, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure a few of you are able to do that. There's actually not a good song that sings the uh, dwarf names. That would probably make it easier. Um, but you probably can recognize there's happy, sleepy, dopey, doc, um, you know, there's a few that you probably can recall, um, but there's probably some that you wouldn't be able to recall. And uh, another way to do this is with a recognition task. Um, so uh, an example of this, let me just pull it up real quick, is, um, is this. So if I were to, well, not that one, that one gives it away. If I were to uh, ask you which are dwarfs here, you would see all these and be able to say, oh, um, you know, is there um, grumpy and dopey? And you'd be able to see them and be like, okay, puffy, that's not a dwarf. Um, the dumpy dwarf is not a dwarf. <laughs> and so um, you, you, um, you might be better able to re uh, recognize the dwarfs than you were to recall the, the names of the dwarfs. Okay, so. Um, um, and that, that suggests something interesting about memory. That suggests that there's a difference between what we have in our memory and what we can recall. That what we can, um, and so researchers uh, make this dis distinction between storage and retrieval. Now, first off, so there's really three stages of memory. There's the encoding, which is the word given to the process of putting something into memory. There's the storage, and then there's a retrieval. And there's a, um, again, you know things, things are in your mind, in your memory, but it's interesting because sometimes you're not able to retrieve it and recall it. And again, recognition, the, these tasks where you give um, cues, clues or cues about, um, about the things that a person may know and they do better, really suggests that part of the um, struggle in memory can actually be about trying to find cues or uh, clues that can help a person remember. Now, um, it's interesting to think about what is forgetting? Is forgetting truly a, uh, a loss in the storage of a memory? Or is it a failure to retrieve a memory? So think about this. What, what if things that you have um, forgotten over the years, what if they're actually still in your brain, in your memory system? You just have lost the capacity to sort of trace it back and be able to access it. It's kind of an interesting idea. Um, and um, we know that a person remembers if their behavior reflects um, previous learning. So when we think about memory, um, we, we really are looking to see not necessarily it's always interesting if it's always best if you can remember it consciously but another part of it is is their behavior reflecting that previous learning 
So again, one of the things that I find reassuring as a teacher is that sometimes students may not be able to consciously recall information that they have, um, that we've covered in a class. You know, maybe they only recall 10% um, six months after the class is over. But um, if their behavior is different, I think of it as a success. So if you behave differently from based on this class so that when you work with clients or with your children or with um, yourself and you are able to um, you know apply reinforcement or apply um, yeah, different uh, ways of parenting that you've learned from this class then I consider it a success even if you cannot consciously access it okay so um, there the uh, there's actually a what's called a three component model of memory uh, this is the Atkins and Schifrin model of memory, and it says that there's three stages for moving something into our, our memory. The first one is sensory, and this one's probably one that you're not as familiar with, um, and I'll explain what it is. Um, then the second you may be more familiar with is short-term memory, and then the third stage is long-term memory. And the main differences are how much information each of these more storage stages can hold, how long they hold each uh, material in storage, and really uh, the differences are what are their functions. So here's a graphic that depicts it. So over here, like um, this is the passing of time. So over here is sensory input, right? We see things, we hear things, we encounter the world around us. You know, maybe this is, um, you're in a classroom or you're watching this video. And the first um, input uh, of that information into your brain goes into what's called the sensory memory. And think of this as a, um, I don't know if you ever saw a plasma TV where sometimes uh, in, in these plasma TVs, there can be like a little burn in and so you'd see things moving quickly. And if it was bright enough, you could see like a tail, like it's moving around and, and you can sort of see the tail to it. Our, our brain does that actually. Um, so that, that's an example of a TV, but our, our brain does something like a burn-in. We hear things after we're done hearing them. We see things after we're done seeing them. And, um, and so we can hold it in this sort of sensory state for a very, very short period of time, up to two seconds, not really longer than two seconds. And, um, and that's what they're referred, referring to when they talk about sensory memory, is that we can hold things in, in, our, in this sensory memory for a very short period of time after we've experienced it. So it's this sort of impression or sensation. And then this is forgotten almost immediately. And, uh, so, you know, we're, we're constantly seeing new things, hearing new things, experiencing, um, and it's often going away really quickly. Now, the second stage really requires attention. So, um, and when I mean attention, I mean it uh, just kind of generically what you mean, uh, what you might think it means is paying attention. So the short-term memory is when we try to pay attention to words, names, numbers, um, and if we try to pay attention to anything that we, um, you know, uh, any sensation, anything that we um, are experiencing. And what we uh, do with short-term memory is we pay attention to it and we try to maintain it. Um, and for as long as we maintain our attention on that thing, we can hold it in mind. So think of like, um, perhaps you, uh, depending on how old you are, um, you know, there was a time when we couldn't just input uh, phone numbers into uh, our phones and have them immediately accessible. We had to remember them. And so in that time, if you were trying to learn someone's um, phone number, you might rehearse it over and over and over and over again. And, you know, it probably easiest if you actually wrote it down, but if you're just trying to remember it, you might say uh, 
uh, like the song. Um, and as long as you're paying attention, you will remember it. As soon as your attention shifts, so somebody distracts you, you will forget. So if you're trying to um, recall a, a grocery list, it's another good example. Um, you might remember bananas and sour cream and um, chips and salsa and you know you have a list of things um, but if it doesn't make it into long-term memory as soon as you stop playing it out in your head it's gone and then um, okay but you know sometimes it stays and if it stays that's a sign that you've encoded it it's actually gone into long-term memory and uh, in long-term memory, you're able to, like the, the name implies, you're able to hold that memory for a longer term, uh, more than just you know 30 seconds that we might see here, or two seconds that we might see here. You can actually um, maintain it indefinitely. And so when you have um, something in here, you're again, you're recalling it indefinitely. Um, and what, what happens if you, if you um, encode it, 8675309, um, it's, a, it's a song if you haven't heard that. Um, uh, but if you have that uh, phone number encoded in your long-term memory, what you can do at any time is bring it back into your short-term memory and play it out and say, okay, uh, 8675309, what I'm, I'm just doing right now is I'm bringing it back to my short-term memory. And so there's this cycle. Anytime I'm recalling things that happened to me in my childhood, anything, um, anything that uh, happened, you know, even a week ago or a day ago, what I'm doing is I'm taking long-term memory and retrieving it and bring it back into short-term memory. So the short-term memory is really the accessible information. Um, anything we're paying attention to at a given moment is our short-term memory. So if you're right now distracted with, um, you know, thinking about some other task that you have to do, or if you are like, oh, I've got an itch, that's what your short-term memory is paying attention to. So whatever, um, so it's really equivalent to your attention. All right. So, okay, let me unpack these. Sensory memories are um, brief sensations of what you just perceived, what you have seen, heard, or tasted something. It's stored it's stored in the physical form it was perceived, sort of like a burn-in on a plasma TV. So if you saw it, you would hold it, that, that sight in your memory for, again, a, a, a couple of seconds after. If you heard it, it, it's almost like it was echoing in your head, or if you tasted it, you can almost continue to taste it. Um, and it, it seems that the reason we have a sensory memory is because if everything, uh, came across our, our uh, if we sensed it, if we perceived it, and then it immediately went away, we really wouldn't have enough time to actually process it. So it seems to just be available so we could process it just a little bit further and help us understand what we just saw. And um, again, I'm, I'm saying that ha this happens for all of our senses, but the main two types are for auditory and visual. For auditory, this should make sense. We call it echoic memory. So we, we hear something and it's almost as if we still are still hearing it. So it's like an echo in our head. And if it's um, visual information, it's iconic. Um, so we, again, we have that sort of burn in visual image that we can maintain. And uh, uh, it's important for detecting changes in our environment. And it allows for the cocktail party phenomenon. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, um, or actually, um, no, I talked about it here. Uh, it, in a large crowd, you can ignore irrelevant voices when you're listening to a certain person speak. So if you're having a conversation, you can listen to that person. And um, if you hear your name spoken by someone else, you can actually shift your attention and uh, are they talking about me? Oh no, it's a different Jennifer. Um, no, so you are able to process information, even um, information that we think we're ignoring. 
And so the, um, this processing actually occurs unconsciously. And again, it's really interesting to think about how much we're actually processing even when we don't um, have an awareness that we're processing it. Okay, now the second type of memory, the second stage is short-term memory. And short-term memory refers to the awareness and recall of items that um, as, as soon as you stop rehearsing it, as soon as you stop paying attention to it, you're not gonna have it accessible. So it, if you, um, uh, the classic way to study this is you might give a person uh, a bunch of nonsense syllables and then um, ask them to recall them after a delay. And uh, so if that person is able to um, hold that in, in their memory and recall the nonsense syllable, then they're, um, it's a sign that they've uh, maintained it in their short-term memory. And there's something, you may have heard this idea before, um, the magic number seven. Um, so the short-term memory has a limited capacity. Your ability to keep things in awareness is about seven plus or minus two. So you have a capacity to recall um, for phone numbers. If you uh, were trying to recall a phone number, seven was about the, the quite a, the average for most people. Um, other studies have actually shown that the most common capacity for people, the mode, if you know what the mode is as opposed to median or, or mean, it's actually five. So most people only have a capacity for about five things in their short-term memory at a time. But again, some people have a, a greater capacity closer to, to nine. Now, one thing we know is that if you want to get around the limited capacity, what you could do is chunk. Um, you combine information into a single bit. Um, so six to six can be chunked together. Um, if I, I mentioned earlier uh, chips, salsa, you could say chips and salsa, and that's now one item, one bit, as opposed to two items, because you've, you've put them together like that. So if you're trying to um, just keep a bunch of things in memory, this is one of the things you, you can do is start pairing them or, or putting them into combinations and saying, oh, I need to have chips and salsa. Oh, I need to have um, cheese and crackers, et cetera. And again, that's chunking. Uh, for numbers, phone numbers, you have 626 area code. That can be chunked together. That's one bit. Now, you've probably heard the idea of working memory. Working memory is is really close to short-term memory. Um, so essentially, for your purpose, you could just say they're synonyms. Um, they're, uh, working memory is thought to be a little bit broader, but um, it's, it's really when we use short-term memory to, um, to work, to do things. And so we use uh, working memory all the time, to-do lists, solving problems, cooking, sequencing tasks, reading, you know, oh, I, if, you're, if you're cooking, you're following a recipe and you're like, oh, I need to pour this in and then, and then stir it right after it. That's using your working memory. Now, um, there's actually another model. So the Atkinson Schifrin model uh, is sensory memory, um, short-term memory, aka working memory, and then long-term memory. Alan Baddeley really helped us understand what is working memory. And so he developed a model of working memory and said that there's um, uh, uh, working memory is a, is a relationship between um, a couple of, uh, well, an executive system and then slave systems that, that uh, serve as buffers of short-term memory. And I'll, I'll show a graphic that explains this. Um, so uh, we have two, buffers in our short-term memory. Uh, think about it as like the, the RAM on a computer. Uh, this is where it's not a hard drive. It's not actually in long-term storage. It is maintaining it in the short term. So we have a phonological loop and a visual spatial sketch pad. Phonological loop. Um, okay, so before we talked about sensory memory, we had 
echoic and iconic. Think of this as sort of the echoic and iconic of working memory. Um, phonological loop is trying to keep things in, in our memory by, um, uh, by, the <clears throat> by the sounds of them. So keeping auditory information in memory. The uh, visual spatial sketch pad is as if you have like a, an actual um, you know, sketch pad, a, a, a picture, an image that you are able to keep in mind. And Badley points out that these are actually separate systems. They, um, they don't interfere with each other. And then there's an executive control system that controls the flow of information in and out of working memory. Um, so um, it keeps potentially distracting information out of these buffers. So here's kind of what it looks like. Um, and so the, um, th this is actually a little bit of an expansion of this idea. I have a third one right here. So let me uh, first give the two main ideas. Okay, so um, if you were trying to remember exactly what I said right now, so if you were trying to go, okay, if you were to remember exactly what I said right now, all right, you have maintained in your memory a phonological loop, a sort of a record player that, that can uh, repeat what you just heard. Um, it's uh, phonological in the sense of its uh, sounds and, and um, usually it's words. And this is what we use with language. If we hear something, we can play it out. So 8675309, I'm playing out uh, verbal information, phonological loop is repeating that so I can maintain it. If you're trying to like any kind of song lyrics, uh, if you're trying to re recall it, that's a, um, you're using your phonological loop, you're repeating it back and saying, okay, here's what they're saying and, and you're keeping it in your, in your short-term memory, your working memory. All right, so you have that for language and sounds, um, but you also have that <clears throat> for things that you've seen. So if I were to show you a picture of some object, you'd be able to maintain a, an image of that object. Um, so if I, if I gave you like a schematic of, a, of an apartment building, you could maintain that in your memory for a period of time. Again, it's not indefinite, but you can, you can keep that in your, um, that image in your memory. And so this is about processing visual information. Um, this, this middle one got added later. You don't have to worry too much about it, but it's this idea that we, um, we could take actual episodes of, um, so we can chronologically, um, right? If you're trying to remember what happened uh, in a, um, if you saw a crime, you have a capacity for an episodic buffer to put things together and like, oh, um, the person came in, they robbed the store, and then they left. That's an episodic buffer that I, I've maintained this idea of what happened. Again, this is not in my last slide. This is a third um, component that's been added. But you'll notice that each of these are overseen by a central executive. This is the idea that when we're trying to um, hold that phone number in memory, hold that grocery list in memory, or kind of keep that visual image in memory, the central executive is a part of our brain that is dictating, okay, this is, um, this is important, stay focused on this, ignore anything else, keep, um, keep your attention on this because um, you really want to remember this and it's gonna keep it in, that, in your memory system. And um, the research has actually shown that there's different parts of the, the brain that align with these different um, elements. So the phonological loop is um, the left, uh, well, I'm, I'm blanking on it. I think it's the ventrolateral uh, prefrontal cortex, and then the, um, the visual spatial is the right, ventral lateral prefrontal cortex, and then the central executive is on the left and right um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. I'm, don't quote me on that, but I believe that's the case. And so um, there's different parts of your brain uh, that are associated with these different regions. Again, the, uh, the phonological loops on the left side 
unsurprising because it's language and you probably know the left is associated with language and you might also know that the right side is associated with visual spatial information and so that's on the right side so this has it's not it's not just a convenient uh, description it actually describes um, or, or depicts what the, the structures of the brain okay so this model describes how memory functions the slave systems maintain incoming information so that it is available for processing it can come in either from our senses or long-term memory the central executive supervises activity in these slave systems controlling the flow of information and processing it for potential long-term storage. And then of course, the, uh, the last one, the episodic buffer integrates information from the slave systems into, a, into coherent episodes. So here I, I saw something, here I heard something, it can actually bring them together. Now, again, I'm using examples that are like memorizing phone numbers or grocery lists, things that like feel like they're specific our working memory is is crucial. We are always using it. Um, well, not always, but we are using it throughout the day. We're we're using it quite a bit. So anything that requires um, attention and and uh, making sure that you're doing it correctly um, is going to require your working memory. So um, if you're writing a paper, you have to um, take. Oh, there was some verbal information you read something in the textbook you bring it back to mind and like oh, okay this seems like it's relevant for this paper um, if you saw a graphic you would say oh this graphic seems to be relevant here um, and you can sort of picture it with your mind and again that's a, a paper but we're doing this when we are um, but when we're we're driving we may do it if we're trying to like remember is there a car behind me and then uh, you, you, yeah. So we do it all the time, and it's and it's actually uh, crucial for a lot of what we would call human behaviors. And so this seems to really be um, our working memory is is sort of the key to our intelligence and the key to doing things um, uh, that animals cannot do. Okay. Now the last stage is long-term memory. Now, initially, theorists um, believed that rehearsal was the key to encoding. Um, so how do, you, how do we get things to long-term memory? Initially, they thought, oh, just play it out multiple times. Um, but if you've ever rehearsed something multiple times and still, still lost it, you can probably attest to this idea that rehearsal doesn't guarantee that you're going to remember something. You can rehearse something 50 times and still not actually learn it. Unfortunately, right? This is what's frustrating about the learning process is that you can put in a lot of effort and sometimes it doesn't actually um, translate into into memory and uh, into long-term storage. And again, this is really relevant for you guys as students. Um, so um, rehearsal, we know it can be interrupted by new material entering short-term memory, so it's really um, vulnerable. But rehearsal, again, doesn't explain why some things that we did not rehearse were remembered. Okay, you probably have seen this where you can recall something um, a long time after, but you never actually rehearsed it. And then also some, some things that we did rehearse were not remembered. And this really suggested, again, this was the initial starting point for theorists, but they, they realized that there needs to be a deeper level of processing. And so um, the, if you just simply say out something, but you're not actually processing it, uh, you're, you're vulnerable to, um, to forget it quite quickly. So, um, there's actually a, a variety of theories that, that look at this idea. Why is it difficult? Um, why does information fail to move from short-term memory to long-term memory? And um, there, there's some uh, good explanations and then there's actually not so good explanations. So it, one idea, and it sort of makes sense, is that memory traces in short-term memory can be lost with the passage of time. 
this is one of those bad theories. Um, memory, memory traces, if we're trying to keep things in our short-term memory, um, it doesn't seem like it's just um, time that is the main factor. Um, because a person, if they maintain their attention, can hold something in memory for a very long time in their short-term memory, you know, for hours. But uh, so the, they came up with this um, alternate theory, it's di displacement. Um, so that uh, replacement of old with new material because there's space limitations in short-term memory. And they said, okay, maybe this is a, a better explanation for why short-term memory doesn't always move to long-term memory, is that sometimes um, new material gets in its way. It's a better theory, but um, again, it doesn't explain why does a person who rehearses something for, you know, um, for minutes and is able to, to focus their attention, why do they sometimes forget exact whatever they were doing? Um, well, that, uh, again, displacement doesn't fully explain it. So um, another idea is interference theory. And this is where um, learning interferes with new learning. Um, older learning can interfere with newer learning. I'm gonna come back to this later. And there, there is some good research showing that this can be the case. Um, but then the, the final understanding is the levels of processing. And that's where um, the, um, uh, the next slide will unpack that. So decay theory and displacement theory. Decay is really bad, Display, displacement's a little bit better, but still not very good. Um, so uh, let me first talk about this levels of processing. All right, so there's this sort of conceptual idea that you can analyze something, um, uh, dissect information at different levels. So if I talk about a word, I could present a word on the screen, like word, you might actually look at, at word and be like, oh, okay, it's, a, it's like a V here, that's a W, the O is a circle, R is a straight line and then a curve, and then D is this curve like a C and then a straight line down. Okay, that's orthographic processing. It's processing the visual characteristics. Phonological could be word, and you're like, okay, there's a, the sound w, and the uh, er, d. And that's a phonological analysis of word. Um, but then I could think about the semantic. What is the meaning of the word word? <laughs> and, it, and I could think about, okay, a word is a series of letters that captures an, a, an idea. <laughs> that's, that's pretty poor. I'm not a good, good at uh, dictionary. I wouldn't be good at writing a dictionary, but um, if I could think about the meaning of the word word or, you know, the meaning of the word information, inform um, is something that will inform us. Okay, if I, if I tasked three groups of people, the first group to process it visually, uh, the second group to process what the word sounds like, and the third to process it semantically, what is the meaning of the word? This last group is the one that's going to do best. If you ask people to to process at a deeper level, what is the um, that thing? Uh, you you're more likely to um, be able to re recall it and move it into long term memory. So if I'm trying to remember a grocery list, if I'm just trying to say, okay, banana, uh, <laughs> sour cream, if I'm trying to process it phonologically or to you know, even to sometimes picture, okay, banana looks like this, sour cream looks like that. Okay, but that's gonna be difficult. But then if, I, if I'm if i like, okay, banana, all right, that's a, that's a snack, that's something I can have after breakfast, and that's something, um, you know, that I can give to my kids. You know, if I'm trying to, to process it at that le deeper level, um, I'm more likely to recall it. Okay, so um, again, if you're trying to study for a test, if you're just trying to think, okay, what does the hippocampus do? Okay, you can sort of uh, look at hippocampus and and you process it at that level, okay? It, or you can think about it phonologically. What does it sound like? 
but you're really more likely to understand it if you really try to focus on, okay, what, um, what is the meaning of the, the word hippocampus and saying, okay, um, uh, the hippocampus is actually relevant to what we're talking about here. It is the sort of center of the memory encoding and saying, if I'm trying to recall information, uh, the hippocampus, or sorry, if I'm trying to encode information, the hippocampus is central to that encoding process. And again, if you try to understand the concept, again, it doesn't mean that it's going to be easy or it's guaranteed, but you're more likely to, um, to recall it. So just generally, if you're trying to, to remember things, try to make it more um, uh, a deeper level of analysis. Okay, so long-term memory is highly stable. We know that there's uh, images and odors that we can recall just poignantly. Um, so if you have um, ever dated someone and you might associate the, their cologne or their perfume with, um, with that person, uh, and images can sometimes really be poignant. We can remember them vividly. Um, but we know actually that long-term memory is generative rather than reproduction. It is not, this is important, it's not an exact reproduction of the past. It is a new creation. When I try to recall something, I'm, I'm bringing it to memory, and in bringing it to memory, I'm adding, potentially adding new things to it. It is not like plus pressing play on a, um, on a DVD if you're trying to recall a, an, an episode. It's not like pulling out um, you know, a, a past record exactly. The recalling process um, exposes it to changes. So if I have a, a key memory from my childhood, every time I recall it, I'm potentially altering that memory. Um, so that's kind of an interesting element of the long-term memory. And um, we know that long-term memory is influenced by understanding. Um, so again, if I'm trying to think about what happened, um, if I am trying to remember what happened at a restaurant, I'm probably gonna operate with the assumption that, you know, things that normally happen at a restaurant happen. So the last time I was at a restaurant, you know, what script, um, I, I have scripts that say, okay, the, the waiter comes or the waitress comes and they ask, uh, you know, they bring the water first. And so we, um, if I'm trying to recall something, I have scripts that guide that recall process. Um, if I have, if I have a, you know, if I, I'm trying to recall what was my, you know, dad like at my graduation, well, I have a schema for what my dad is like generally, I'm probably gonna, that's probably gonna play into my memory of the event. And then finally, long-term memory is better for some items uh, that are more striking, more meaningful, and more emotional. And uh, I'll come back to that in a little bit, but um, let me give you a few examples. Um, so stable stability of images and orders so if uh if we're trying to um we had 17 to 22 year old uh students they match odors with names at least two out of three times so the uh if if you if you gave them a, a name for an odor that they probably had never smelled before they um they could identify it um recently but if you ask them to come back, like I forget how, how long, how much later, but let's say it's a week later and to um, you expose them to the smell and ask them what's the name of this smell, they are, 74% um, of them will get it correctly. And so it just shows that they, uh, for odors, people have a very good memory. Um, here's another interesting idea. Our schemas influence our memory. So at five-year-olds, uh, five years old, um, you ask children to draw a picture of a, of a jug that was on its side. They might draw it like this, that the water is vertical, which obviously cannot happen. And if it's here, that the water goes
goes across as opposed to being flat. So here, seven-year-olds still um, mess this up. Nine-year-olds, though, as you might expect, would say, okay, it's tilted over. It's the water inside of it's flat. And here, the water is flat. So um, they draw the water line correctly only when they understand the principle that water tends to remain level. So the schema influenced their memory. They never saw this. They never saw this. They never saw this one here. Um, and so they're, they actually distort what they, um, what they saw. Okay, so again, our schemas distort our memories. All right, so uh, something kind of related to this is um, flashbulb memories. So what do you remember of the assassination of Osama bin Laden? Um, I think that was a pretty key moment for many of us where we uh, remember this hallway that the pro President Obama walked down and, and spoke at the podium. Um, many of you probably saw that live. Um, that, that was sort of a key memory that got um, burned into our national consciousness. Uh, and for me, another one uh, was like O.J. Simpson trial. I don't know if you guys are old enough to remember this. Some of you definitely are. I, so I myself was actually in, in school and we, we stopped our, uh, our, our school day and turned on the TV in class and watched the O.J. Simpson trial, the, the breaking news that he was acquitted. And so I, I rem remember that pretty vividly. I, I can remember the classroom I was in. I was in a math classroom and the professor, or the teacher I had. And, um, and so this, this is what would be called a flashbulb memory. Now we have these um, collectively, but flashbulb memories can also be individual to you personally, right? And probably most of your flashbulb memories are individual, but um, researchers, they can't study individual flashbulb memories um, that are unique to you. So they often study things that are, are common uh, across a society, JFK, uh, the Challenger explosion, you know, um, so I guess, uh, you know, different events that we've seen. Um, so these, uh, Vivid recollections um, are associated with first becoming aware of some especially emotional information. I'm thinking of hearing about Kobe's death. And, you know, I was at church at the time that I, I heard about it. I saw it on my phone and just couldn't believe it. Um, and so the, uh, we generally have this uh, uh, perception that they're highly accurate. However, um, the research shows that they become more distorted as time goes by. Um, so uh, recollections of the O.J. Simpson trial became less accurate, although people, and this is important, stated that they were just as confident in their memories. So they weren't aware that they, their memories had become distorted. So when you think about something that, that was really vivid that you encountered, it's really important to recognize that um, you may not actually have a, uh, an accurate memory of, of that event, even if you are confident in it. And that has applications to eyewitness testimony and criminal proceedings, because sometimes um, um, uh, witnesses will claim that they are very confident of their memory for an event, but they're not actually accurate. So like other memories, flashbulb memories are generated, not rep reproduced. So um, short-term memory and long-term memory comparison. So short-term memory is an active con continuing process. It's, it's all about attention. It's easily disrupted by ongoing activities. It's limited in capacity, seven plus or minus two. And short-term memory retrieval is either immediate and automatic or it doesn't recur. You don't have to work to recall something using short-term memory. Long-term memory, though, is a more passive process. It's not easily disrupted by ongoing activities. It's essentially unlimited in capacity. Um, and, and so we have uh, 
uh, we, we've never encountered a, a person who just cannot learn more because they have already learned too much. No. Uh, so long-term memory may be considerably, uh, uh, long-term memory retrieval tends to be more cons considerably slower and more groping. You've probably had the experience of uh, tip of the tongue. Oh, what's that person's name? Oh, what's the name of that, you know, uh, actor or, or, you know, something like that. And, um, and some, it, it, sometimes it comes to you uh, an hour or two later. Um, but uh, yeah, that's the nature of long-term memory and trying to retrieve from it. All right, so let me unpack the long-term memory. Uh, there's two main types. Uh, there's explicit and then implicit. So explicit are also called declarative memories. So these are memories that can be remembered and verbalized. You could say what you know. Implicit memories are non-declarative because um, they are things that you know, but you cannot verbalize and, and describe. So generally those are procedural memories like, uh, like riding a bike. So there's a way that you can potentially put it into words, but it's more, um, it's encoded not in words, but in, in your motor movements. It, it's, it's in your muscle memory, things like that. So if you think about driving a stick shift, again, you can potentially explain a, how to drive a stick shift verbally, but most of us, if you know how to drive one, you, you know it because you have the movement sort of encoded in your, in your, your um, brain and in your muscles. And so the, um, the physiological evidence has shown that you can have damage to one type of memory and it doesn't affect the other. So you can have damage that affects the explicit um, memories, um, but it may not affect implicit memories. So um, again, uh, this tends, this is because these are in different parts of the brain. Uh, explicit memories involve the hippocampus. Implicit memories involve the basal ganglia, and those are different structures in the brain. So, um, okay, so if you take implicit, expli sorry, explicit memories, you can divide them up into two types. Uh, one type is semantic memories. These are facts or general knowledge. The second type is episodic memories. So these are specific autobiographical events with a spatial and temporal concept, contacts. So for semantic memories, you might say, oh, I know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Um, an episodic memory is, oh, I remember well, where I was when I found out that Kobe Bryant had died. So semantic memories often get separated from the episodes in which they were first learned. So you may not remember um, where you first heard about Columbus, but you probably know who Columbus was. And so um, the semantic memory, the fact, doesn't get encoded with the episodic context most of the time. So um, if you're trying to think about the, um, you know, what are, uh, what are the different types of apples? You probably don't recall where you might have learned that, um, but um, you can remember, you know, several different types of apples. All right, so here, here it is again, uh, the model of memory. You've got sensory memory, short-term memory, long-term memory, um, and we divide up long-term memory into declarative and non-declarative memory. Uh, declarative memory can be divided up into semantic memory and episodic memory. And, um, and so um, again, semantic is uh, principles, facts, strategies, uh, knowing that the Pyrenees separate France and Spain. Episodic memory is personal autobiographical knowledge, memory of doing things, recalling cycling through, uh, well, this is from the textbook, Ron Sevalier in the rain. Um, and then you have non-declarative memory, which is unconscious, unverbalized uh, uh, um, motor skills or classically conditioned responses. So doing a triple somersault, I definitely cannot. But um, if you know how to do that, you may not be able to describe what you're doing, but you know how to do it. All right. So physiology, um, where are memories located in the brain? This has been one of those concepts that people have um, researchers have been very interested in. And one of the things that they um, initially started to seek out is what's called the Ingram. 
uh, the Ingram is a physiological marker of a memory. Uh, so uh, Carl Lashley uh, was in search of the finding the Ingram. And what he, he did was he took rats that had learned how to navigate a maze and performed lobotomies on them. So took out pieces of their cortex and then put them back in and tried to see if they could still navigate the maze. What he found is that regardless of where he, he took out different areas from different rats, regardless of where uh, the, the damage to their cortex was, the rats could, could actually still navigate the maze. It was kind of remarkable that, um, uh, that he, he couldn't locate where it was um, in the cortex that they were able to, uh, they stored this memory of how to navigate the maze. So Lashley actually took that as evidence that um, we don't locally um, store memories. They're not uh, stored in specific areas. They're actually distributed across the entire brain. <clears throat> now, um, so that was one key finding that sort of shaped people and made them think, okay, maybe memories aren't in specific spots. Um, uh, Penfield, however, was a neurosurgeon, and <clears throat> what, he, what he found is that if you stimulate specific regions, they could actually uh, trigger vivid memories. Um, so the memories of uh, like, a, so we, we know that, um, we know that in fact, during neurosurgery, people don't feel pain. Uh, you may not know that, but you can actually stimulate parts of their brain while they're still conscious and that doesn't hurt it doesn't they don't have any pain receptors in the brain so um, they often actually do that during neurosurgery to make sure that you know they're not wiping out a memory um, and oftentimes people are able to um, you know um, have a some sort of a basic uh, response and say oh i hear something when you um are stimulating that spot, but um, but it's not been replicated where you can take a, a really complex entire memory based on stimulating a, a single spot. Um, so we think that it's somewhat in between these two, Lashley and Penfold, that um, it's not that memories are stored in a single spot, but uh, it's not true that they're completely distributed and they're not, um, there's no way to, in, uh, localize them at all. So um, we, we think the research now suggests that uh, particular aspects of a memory get stored in particular areas of the brain, but the entire memory is distributed. So for the rats, um, when you think about how, to, how a rat navigates a maze, it could navigate it um, visually, but it can also navigate it with smell, uh, rats have good smell. It can navigate it based on texture. It, and so the, the thought is that maybe the rats are actually um, navigating the maze and, and they do have specific localized memories, but that they have duplicates so that if you take out this part of the brain, um, it could still navigate the, the maze because it has other parts of the brain that have different elements of, a, of the memory, but that they can rely on to navigate it. So um, again, there, there is localized parts of our memory that are stored in specific spots in our brain, but that we have duplicates. And so like any given memory of like your high school graduation is gonna be using a lot of the brain. And, uh, and yet, um, so there might be small parts that are like, oh, just the, um, you know, the memory of what it smelled like you could potentially damage that if you damage a part of the brain, but the overall is still going to be there. Um, okay, this last uh, bullet point is kind of interesting. Uh, one researcher found that memories could be passed to other worms by feeding them worms that had learned a particular response. Uh, fascinating, but it's not been replicated, so we don't know if that's actually true. Okay, so. Um, I want to focus, I'll, uh, I'll uh, skip over this part. So declarative long-term memory. 
it's associated with the temporal lobe, particularly the hippocampus. Um, and uh, so this is the temporal lobes on the side and uh, what's on both sides. And it has um, towards the middle of the brain, there is the hippocampus and that structure in particular is highly involved in, in declarative long-term memories. Non-declarative long-term memories is associated with other parts of the brain, uh, neocortex, amygdala, cerebellum, uh, basal ganglia for things like you know, uh, muscle movements. Those are um, uh, basal ganglia is a, a key structure. So again, memory is localized to general brain regions, but rarely is it stored in a specific location of the brain. Okay, now uh, forgetting. Uh, I, I mentioned this before, why do we forget? Uh, so there's possible reasons we forget information in long-term memory. Well, one is brain injury. Maybe we forget because there's been damage to the brain. All right, that, that could explain some forgetting, right? We, over the course of our lifetime, some of our neurons die, and, and so maybe that's part of the reason why we forget, but it's probably not the biggest explanation for forgetting. Another idea is that is called fading theory, that long-term memory may simply fade over time. It's sort of like the decay theory with short-term memory. But again, time in and of itself is likely not the real reason information is forgotten. Um, another idea is retrieval cue failure. Forgetting may be due to a lack of cues that could help with retrieval. Um, so one type is called cue-dependent forgetting. Um, and that's where the person may lack the appropriate cues for recall. So maybe this is a case of um, the uh, tip of the tongue phenomenon, right? Where you're trying to remember, oh, what's the name of that actor in that movie? You may just um, be lacking uh, if, you, if you could sort of think about the other actors, um, you'd be able to retrieve that, that particular actor. Um, and so maybe it's, it's the lack of other cues, right? So the, the dwarfs, um, maybe uh, if you're trying to recall the dwarfs, you just can't recall um, different cues. You can't recall the scenes in which Sneezy is, is sneezing. Um, and maybe that's why you have to forget. Um, the other explanation is trace dependent forgetting. This is where the, the trace itself, which is the, the word to say, um, the storage of the memory itself could actually have changed. Um, all right, so uh, two the um, the theories of forgetting have also looked at interference. When two memories are similar, the strength of either or both may be reduced. And we have two types of interference. One is proactive interference, um, and the other is retroactive interference. So proactive interference is where Old information makes it more difficult to learn new information. Um, all right, so things that you have known in the past makes it difficult to uh, learn this new material. So if you're trying to learn a programming language, if you learned um, you know, how to program in Java, it may be more difficult to learn how to program in, in Python, for instance. That, that's proactive interference. It's, it's affecting new learning. The other type of interference is retroactive. And this is where new information disrupts old learning. So you may be, um, maybe you have learned Spanish, you try to learn French as well, and now you've learned French, and now some of the, you're getting it confused with some of the Spanish you've already learned. So that's where the new information disrupts old information. All right, and now there's a simple mnemonic, right? So how, this is one of those things that people sometimes struggle to, to recall and, and remember and, and uh, understand. So uh, a mnemonic can help. So if you're trying to distinguish between proactive and retroactive, uh, think of proactive means previously acquired information interferes with newly acquired memories. So proactive starts with PR, uh, means previously acquired information is interfering with newly acquired information. Retroactive means recent information is interfering with previously acquired memories. Okay, now that's uh, that's a little bit long, but 
Okay, again, it might help you if you're trying to recall this. It's, it is difficult. So let me give you a couple of examples of this to help you. So let's say a quarterback was trying to learn a, a playbook. All right, they've already learned this play, cut and run. And now they're trying to learn run for it. The quarterback made a mistake and thought the receiver was cutting after 10 yards, which was the other play that they had learned, cut and run. Okay. What kind of interference would that be? Well, you have previous information, cut and run is interfering with learning a new thing, run for it. Um, so this is uh, proactive interference, all right? Now here, after learning the options for squeaky clean, the, the quarterback tried to use these options with the play he learned earlier, clean sweep. Uh, so this is where uh, you have retroactive interference. Recently learned information, he just learned this. Um, it interferes with a play he learned earlier, clean sweep. So uh, this is retroactive. Recent information interfering with past information. Okay, um, a few other theories of forgetting. Distortion theory, some me memories may be incomplete, but we may fill in the gaps. So um, uh, this is the idea that uh, when we have an episode and we're trying to explain it, we may just sort of, and we may not do it intentionally, we may just say, oh, okay, I think this is what happened. And our memory just does it automatically so we don't even know. That might actually be a reason why eyewitness testimony can be so unreliable. Um, and now uh, one interesting uh, question is, why do some memories come back after being out of awareness? Well, Freud, you can really trace this back to Freud. Freud argued for repression theory, that traumatic events are repressed from memory and can be retrieved once the anxiety is alleviated. Um, this is actually hard to prove, and it's actually very controversial. In fact, I, I want you to be very skeptical about this idea. Because in back in the 80s, this was happening uh, quite frequently where therapists were working with clients. And what they were trying to do uh, is they're like, oh, you seem like you're struggling with something. You seem like you're, you're um, getting stuck on um, certain beliefs and, and feeling certain ways. So I think you must have been abused in your, in your childhood. And the therapist is trying to uncover that abuse. And oftentimes what they do is um, they, um, that, that process of suggestion can actually evoke some memories. So it, uh, uh, sometimes that person will recall, and I'm using finger quotes purposely, they'll recall getting abused by their father or mother. Um, and uh, now sometimes you don't know if that's true or not. It's really difficult, but sometimes we know that uh, there was factual evidence to prove that the recalled memory was never actually occurred. So um, we know that therapists, and again, this happened frequently, uh, particularly in the 80s and, and early 90s, uh, therapists have sort of learned their lesson, but they have, um, they used to do this, and they still do it today, where they can suggest certain memories occurred when they just didn't occur. And the person can sometimes develop very vivid recollections of something that never occurred. So these false memories, our recovered memories, uh, may actually be largely false. Again, they're based on this idea that Freud had about that we repress them, um, but they don't actually prove to be true. So here's the thing. We know that high stress, high anxiety can interfere with memories. There's no evidence that if you, if you um, help them work through the anxiety or stress, that that memory can actually come back fully. Um, so we know that the first part of repression theory is true, um, that we know that stress can make it more difficult to remember something. We don't think the second part, that it can be retrieved once, once the anxiety is alleviated is true. Uh, we think that if, if it's gone, it's gone forever. Um, it's not hiding away in the unconscious, uh, like Freud suggested. Okay, so um, sort of a, a, a big picture summary and, and appraisal. 
Um, so again, the current models of memory describe a three component memory storage system, sensory memory, uh, short-term memory, long-term memory. The, uh, the models of long-term memory currently are associationistic. Uh, they focus on how memories are related to other memories. Uh, it's similar to Hebb's ideas, neurons that fire together, wire together. So when I'm trying to recall some things, you know, um, when I'm trying to recall the, the seven dwarfs, I get them connected together. So how do you how do you learn better? How do you apply this to your own education? Um, well, uh, if you're trying to do that, you really want to um, focus on um, rehearsal, elaboration, and organization. So one way to do this is to um, to uh, we, we suggest if you're reading your textbook, first off, skim it and just look at the headings and try to understand what's the big picture that I'm I'm being um, I'm looking at. So go through the entire chapter and uh, look for the headings and say, okay, here is how and, and you know there's headings and then subheadings. So try to get a big picture of what is this chapter doing? How is it organizing the information? Then when you come back to the information, now you could place it within certain uh, structures, right? So it's not just about, um, you know, fact, 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 fact. It's about putting the, organize, uh, the information in an organization. If you do that, you'll be better inclined to remember. Uh, another is to use mnemonics. I gave you the um, mnemonic of, Proactive interference is uh, previously learned information interfering with uh, newer information. And then retroactive is recently learned information interfering with um, uh, older knowledge. So mnemonics can help. Uh, you probably know Roy G. Biv, um, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's, those are the colors of the, of the rainbow. Um, or please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Uh, and again, you may know different versions of these, but that's parentheses, uh, exponent, um, uh, multiplication, division, addition, subtraction. That's the order of operations. Uh, so those can be helpful. It is um, one uh, mnemonic is to actually, um, it's called the loci system. This was used by some monks if they were trying to remember. Imagine yourself walking through a household and, and imagine putting them into different, um, uh, if you're trying to remember objects, remember um, sort of connect it with particular rooms. So if you're trying to re recall what is a hippocampus, uh, you might put a hippo into um, one of the rooms and that room is a room of um, pictures from your childhood. So you're like, okay, there's a hippo and it's in a room with memories. Um, so hippocampus is related to memories. Then you go to um, uh, amygdala, uh, another room, and if you're like, what does amygdala do? Well, amygdala is an almond shape, um, and that's what amygdala actually means, I think, in Latin. And so you might have a room of um, uh, almonds, and that room of almonds has a uh, bunch of emotional uh, content, so different, uh, you know, um, things that get under your skin, things that make you mad, things that make you scared, um, and so that could be a way to do it. Um, and again, locating these memories in space is one way to do it. Um, and again, your your book has some other examples of this. So, um, and I encourage you again if you struggle with recalling information for tests, it'd be a good idea to invest in your education and try to learn some of these um, strategies because they, they work. And so if you uh, learn the mnemonics, you might actually find like the time you invest learning them can shorten the time uh, you spend studying. And so it, it could certainly pay off. So a few other tips, if you're trying to remember something, uh, remember depth of processing. Don't just rehearse the information. Don't just say, okay, uh, hippocampus uh, processes his memory. 
Okay, amygdala uh, is emotional center. Don't just rehearse it. Try to, again, process it at a deeper level. Um, try to make it more meaningful. If you're trying to remember a grocery list, try to think, what, what am I trying to, um, why am I getting sour cream? Oh, I'm making enchiladas and I want to put sour cream on it. Try to um, process it at a, a deeper level because you'll be more likely to remember. Another thing, transfer appropriate processing. You remember best when you're in the situation where you learn the material. Um, so if you're trying to, um, well, we know this from uh, scuba diving, actually. They found that scuba divers weren't remembering uh, things that they learned in a classroom setting when they're underwater. So they, they learned, oh, we got to teach some of these principles while the person is underwater. Uh, so if you're trying to re recall uh, something from a, uh, a classroom setting, you might want to be in a certain space in your, your house so that you um, are recalling. And again, the place where you learn it should be the place where you get tested. And then always put your memory in context. Remember, you remember better when you have a context for the material. Again, skim the material before reading it. Um, okay, and then I said this, uh, singing, rhyming, make an outline, use images, use names, use phrases. Uh, you know, engage your creativity in the process. Okay. All right, so I think these are the last slides. Um, some clinical implications of memory. Well, first off, ADHD is thought to involve problems in executive control of working memory. Okay, so the, the problem is that um, in ADHD, the, the person has good phonological loop, the, the child or adult has a good phonological loop, good um, visual spatial sketch pad, but they have poor executive control over their working memory. So they can't control the things that they are attending to. So um, oftentimes people with ADHD, they struggle to get focused. They struggle to um, focus their attention and say, oh, this is important. I need to pay attention. Sometimes they start something and can't stop themselves on it. So they might be playing video games for hours because they can't stop their brain and uh, focus on it. And so, um, yeah, again, that's, uh, again, the, the frontal lobe of the brain seems to have some deficits. Uh, we know brain injuries can cause problems with memory. We know this even better in recent years. Um, so we know about uh, traumatic brain injury, stroke, amnesia. Um, uh, we know chronic traumatic encephalopathy, CTE, and uh, how that can impact memory. And then uh, dementia. So uh, Alzheimer's affects episodic memory, then semantic memory, then, uh, at, and really at a later stage, the ability for conditioning and certain skills can disappear. Um, so even the non-declarative memory can can um, be lost at that the late stages where they don't have the capacities that they had um, when they were younger. And of course, there's uh, Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia, um, but there's many other types of dementia as well. All right, so that. We flew through that all. Uh, hopefully this is helpful to you and um, I'm gonna wrap up here. Okay, take care.